I mean, Father Rosham, uh, who incidentally was too nervous to attend here this evening. From an opaque court, all white clothing, circular rackets and a ball you could barely see on the TV, to wider rackets, better quality of streams and a ball that is actually visible. This is the same tournament 40 years later, the British Open. Squash has changed a lot in those 40 years, and across this documentary the past, present and future of the game will be explored through various levels of the industry, from the top of the sport to the casuals playing for fun. This is the rise, fall and future of Squash. In the past, squash was always considered a posh and elitist game. Only private schools or private clubs tended to have squash courts. There was even a court on the Titanic. However, the sport was considered to still be fairly casual until one man hit the headlines. When I was young, you know, when I was kind of 10, 9, 10 years old, I'd say probably early 80s, 80s around there, um, you know, Jonah Barrington was obviously a huge name, big catalyst really for the game in this country as we know it. Um, or knew it back then and I, I just remember um, clubs going from like two three courts up to like 12 or 15 um, and then back down again you know in the 90s. This capacity crowd at the Wembley Conference Centre enjoying the climax of this marvellous uh, squash battle in the over 35 category between Jonah Barrington and uh, Ahmed Safwat. In those days Wembley Conference Centre um, sold out year after year for the semi-finals and the finals with more than 3,000 spectators and we saw the biggest crowd ever in squash four and a half thousand people inside the Royal Albert Hall for the World Team Championships and what a golden era that was and the big thing was nobody could see the big crash coming but then along came the start of the fitness industry and a lot of the private club owners realized they could make more money by converting their courts into fitness spaces. And instead of two players occupying that space for a game of squash, they could put in numerous fitness machines and make a whole lot more money. And sadly, when they left, all the creativity, their business knowledge, and the commercial side of the game went with them. So, where does this leave us now? Well, on court, two generations are doing battle, but the two players grew up with very different levels of squash participation. Well, when I started playing squash in the 80s, and throughout the 80s for that matter, squash was a game that everybody wanted to play. Up here on these courts, peak time ran from 5 o'clock through to 11 o'clock at night, and every single court was booked. The committee meetings were always about people who did book a court and then were late or sometimes hadn't turned up but it was a real 24-7 uh, virtually game, seven days a week, and trying to get into a club was difficult, let alone getting on a court. I, it's definitely been a lot less than when my dad started playing. Um, the peak time has never really been over the weekend. There is no peak time. Um, I've never struggled to get courts, um, which is a good thing in some ways for practicing, but it does mean when you go to tournaments, there is less people to play and therefore there's less tournaments. Statistics from the last five years show that between 2016 and 2020, there was 150,000 drop in squash participants in England. The COVID-19 pandemic caused a massive drop off in 2021, as in most countries, like England, it was not possible to play the game. The drop off before the pandemic is the more worrying statistic, however, as over a quarter of England's players seem to have stopped playing over five years. And I think, I think over time what's probably happened is the this is my view of it. I think the game's become a lot more professional over the last 20, 30 years because of Jonah. Um, you know, the PSA have done a great job in terms of like the world circuit. The, the game is so global. You know, when I was a junior and we played British Junior Opens, um, you know, you had a handful of nations really. Um, you know, Egypt weren't on the map at that point and, you know, South America and places like that. So I think, um, or, or North America even, and I think, What's happened because the game's grown globally 
and there's far more people playing worldwide, um, the kind of scene at home, the domestic scene has suffered. The Manchester Open, a silver-ranked tournament on the PSA World Tour, situated inside the National Squash Centre, where some of the world's best male and female players look to take home the tournament trophy and increase their world rankings. However, being right next to the Etihad Stadium, the National Squash Centre is constantly reminded of the world's biggest sport, football. In a city with such footballing heritage, it makes you wonder if those involved in squash ever compare the two sports. I don't know whether we have to work towards that really. I, th I think we've been trying to better other sports and I just think we need to just keep concentrating on what we do really. I think, you know, squash is a great game. A lot of people love it. Um, we need to do the obvious things in terms of how we get it out to people and we bring in new people and new fans to the sport. That's always going to be a big thing. But, you know, I don't know whether, I don't know, you know, we're always talking about getting more TV and more sponsorship and kind of gets quite tiring in the end. I mean, obviously there are people, the official lines are obviously always looking for that stuff. But we, I think we just need to concentrate on what we've got and the great players we have playing the sport, the unbelievable athletes, the great venues around the world that is tremendous. And, and you know, so yeah, I think we've, we've tried all that and I, I, just, I just think let's just look at what we do well and let's, you know, keep, keep trying to improve. It is no secret that the sport has suffered in recent years, but there are many ideas on how to revive it. One of the programmes that I'm an ambassador for, Rackets Cubed, is just expanding exponentially, doing that in lots of areas, um, and that's being really successful. And then, so I think it's targeting outside that would really help with the participation and how do we get more of the general public, not necessarily just children, wanting to play squash. And um, I think uh, I'm, I'm a little bit past the, I'm a little bit older than the generation that could do it, but I think the, the sort of social media can play a huge part of that. And um, if we can get some real sort of social influencers who are championing squash, I think that could that could be massive as well. Talking about stuff is always harder to, to get it over, so I love to get, I mean, I'm doing a lot of coaching now, so it's great when you see a school come in and they get on the court and they do it. So the best thing is, you know, do it, you know, and you've got like here, you've got like the, 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 the wall and the um, interactive stuff. That's, that's great for, you know, you can see it there. The kids are on it now playing it. And obviously, so you've got the best of both worlds. You're watching the best players here on the, in the world. So you've got the inspiration, then they can go and do it. That's just brilliant. Um, but yeah, it, well, if you know, if I'm trying to convince people about squash, it's a great way. It's a fantastic battle between two people, uh, or four if you're playing doubles. Um, so if you've got a friend or a, a person who you can play with, and you, similar standard, it's one of the you know, great sports. You're in a box, you know, you're running, you're getting some energy burn. It's um, fantastically healthy sport. Perhaps the biggest and easiest platform for promotion of the sport is this year's Commonwealth Games, hosted in Birmingham this summer. Previous games have pulled in big crowds at the events and even larger audiences on TV. Hugely successful Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in 2014. I was delighted to be the MC and it was amazing talking to pack crowds, 2,500 fans at the Scottsdale Arena every day for 11 days, singles and doubles. In, it's going to go on primetime TV. We saw it happen in Glasgow uh, in 2014 when James McMatthew played the final. Um, there was something like 1.3 million viewers on BBC live, you know, middle of the day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the game, they're doing a fantastic job at the moment in, in Birmingham. You know, there's all sorts of initiatives going off. I was down at something a couple of months back and they had an outdoor court in the, um, in the, in the city centre and, you know, a big kind of push for the games itself with various sports and demonstrations going on, um, interviews and local media and so on. And there's, lo there's lots of plans for that. I think there's something happening throughout Easter um there's, there's a whole week of it i think at new street station so yeah i mean it, it, it's got to have a bit of an impact and really i think it's a, it's our role in squash you know particularly the governing body to try and push um you know that as much as we possibly can to try and raise the profile whilst we've got this opportunity so there you have it there have been some radical changes to squash over the last 40 years the game has risen tremendously and fallen in certain areas as well 
The future rests on the ability to keep the game fun at a casual level to increase participation and save the sport.